Thank you all for coming. Good turnout tonight. Uh, my name is Brandon Cardwell. I'm the executive director of an organization called the iGate Innovation Hub. Um, if you don't know what we do, uh, we're a nonprofit organization focused on building a thriving startup community here in the Tri Valley. Um, we, we operate something called The Switch, which is our co working space and incubator for startups and entrepreneurs in downtown Livermore. Um, where we are right now is called Innovate Pleasanton. I don't think Greg Hitchin is in the house right now, but he's the guy who makes all this happen so that we can make this happen. Um, so big thank you to Innovate Pleasanton. I also want to make sure we thank um, our title sponsor, the City of Pleasanton. Where's Pam Ott? Pam Ott's got her hand up right there. Uh, she's the Economic Development Director from the City of Pleasanton. Major, major sponsor of our organization, um, and we couldn't do what we do without them. So if you want to know what's happening in Pleasanton, if you've got something you want to talk about in a business idea, uh, Pam's the one to talk to. Um, so thank you to, to Pam Ott. Help us, uh, help us thank City of Pleasanton, please. Also want to thank Goodwin Proctor and Silicon Valley Bank um, who helped pay for all the food and the beer and the wine. So if you like the food and the beer and the wine, let's give them a round of applause. Okay, so, uh, so Greg Hitchin was going to be my introduction, but he had to step out. Um, so I'll just tell you that um, Greg Hitchin's been a, a local guy here in the community who's helped out um, startups that we've worked with. Um, our alumni companies on the iGate side of things have raised about $50 million in capital over the last couple of years. A lot of that has to do with Greg and his efforts at helping those companies connect to investors um, and, and corporate partners. So he's now working on a project that I'm not sure if we can talk about yet. We can? Okay, good. We can talk about it. Um, so he and, and Sally, Dave Sellinger, who's going to be part of our program, are working on raising a venture fund focused on Tri-Valley companies. So for those of you who are entrepreneurs in the audience and are going to be looking to access some capital soon, um, well, talk to me. Don't talk to them. So, you know, I can, <laughs> I can help you. Uh, but uh, he's been a pillar of the community, and now that Sally's joined and plugged into our startup community here, uh, it's been a big boost for us. So um, I'm going to invite Yolanda Finchenko to come up, who's my partner in crime on this. Um, Yolanda is one of the co-founders of the East Bay Bio Network, and she's going to introduce our uh, program panelists. Thanks. Thank you, Brandon. So um, I'd like to introduce myself and the, my uh, co-conspirators for the East Bay Bio Networking. Greg Hitchin, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. So um, the East Bay Bio Networking Group is exactly what it sounds like. It's a group of us who work in life sciences, um, who either live or work, or maybe both in the East Bay. And it's a way for us to connect with each other, to help grow our careers, and to um, uh, basically find opportunity. Um, so my co-organizers are Naraj and Tim in the back. And, uh, and our goal is usually just to find a way for people to connect. And um, we've been around for a couple years. This year we decided very intentionally to move into some programming and to make a focal point entrepreneurship. Um, in order for entrepreneurs to succeed, um, you need everyone. You need an ecosystem. And that includes um, anchor companies like BioRad or Thermo Fisher or Roche. That includes uh, aspiring entrepreneurs. That includes current entrepreneurs. That includes startups that have funding. That includes startups seeking for funding. But the main thing is, is we want a focal point for these constructive collisions, for people to find each other, um, not just to start companies, maybe to hire or uh, gain expertise or um, somehow be able to uh, use the generosity that we've built in this networking group to help um, grow and innovate. Um, so that's the spirit of the group, and um, we're really pleased to partner with iGate to bring you uh, Selly and uh, Hemi. Um, Selly is a serial entrepreneur, a serial philanthropist, um, a serial investor, and, um, and hopefully not a serial killer. We've covered sociopathy, <laughs> but we haven't got to psychopathy. So. So yay. <laughs> um, and we've decided, um, Sally uh, has um, volunteered really to um, help us with this event and to uh, kind of elicit some of the wisdom from our, our, spe our speaker, um, which is really going to be a conversation with Hemi Parthasar. Parthasarthi, I practiced this so many times. Parthasarthi, who is the director of, um, uh, the scientific director for Breakout Labs. And Breakout Labs, for those of you who are not familiar with this, is uh, uh, basically a, a, a organization funded by the Teal Foundation and helps 
innovators, scientists, engineers, um, who are very fo focused on technology and what someone referred to as deep science, but which is something that I think those of us in the life sciences really understand. You get so focused on understanding these very hard to understand problems, every so often you get that spark and you realize that what you've discovered can help a lot of people. But that focus on technology and on science doesn't always translate to a focus on a problem or a market. And that's where Breakout Labs helps people break out from their, <laughs> from their focus, their deep, deep science focus. So hopefully between uh, Hemi and Sully, we're gonna hear a little bit about how one brings science to a solution to a market. Good evening, everyone. So, uh, first of all, thank you again to, to all of our sponsors for being here. And then, uh, secondly, I do want this to be an interactive event as much as possible. I, I haven't yet had an event here where there was a dearth of questions, and I hope this is not the first one where, where we actually run out of questions. So, about uh, 15, 20 minutes in here, I'm going to flip this over and, uh, and go back to the audience and, and really encourage you guys to think about any questions you have uh, for him here. So, I'll start out by just allowing you to introduce yourself a little bit, um, and like, why don't we focus on the kind of the science side of things, and tell us a little bit about what your career has been like as a, as a scientist. Thanks, everyone, for uh, being here. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm the scientific director for Breakout Labs, but before uh, that uh, phase of my career, I started out as a neuroscientist, uh, biophysicist and neuroscientist, and really thought that I was going to spend my life in academia. Um, and then, at a certain point, partway through my postdoc, I began to realize I'd probably have to do a second and a third postdoc, and um, things weren't looking so great on the funding horizon at that particular moment in time, and um, got a, a offer to work for the journal Nature as a peer review a editor handling peer review uh, of neuroscience. So I joined Nature and uh, became the North American editor out in Washington, D.C. at a time when there was really only one biological sciences editor for Nature, not hundreds out in the, in, in the United States. Um, and then came out here sometime later to help start the Public Library of Science Open Access uh, Science Journals. So that's what brought me to the Bay Area. After 10 years of doing scientific peer review, I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly, and really thought that it was probably time to do something a little bit different for my own sanity, and um, made a connection with the Teal Foundation. And that's how I came to be the scientific director for Breakout Labs. And, and what was the inspiration? What, what, so you, you can certainly see the, uh, maybe the lack of desire to stay on the peer reviewed side, but like what, what brought you specifically to Breakout Labs? So. It was actually, I, I met my colleague, Lindy, who's the executive director of the program, and she was interested in starting something out of the foundation that would help in this process of translating um, outstanding science into meaningful impact in society. And so we, the, the foundation, Peter's foundation is, is relatively small, this is Peter Thiel, our, our benefactor, and um, it's, it's really based around a couple of different programs. And, uh, we, were, we were very interested, obviously, in entrepreneurship and this problem of how to bring great science out into the world and seeing that philanthropy really had a role to play in helping to bridge this gap between all this money that goes into basic science and all that work that happens in academia and the incentive structure there and the, the point where real investors and, and corporates start to get interested in the technology. Uh, for me, it was an opportunity you know, I, I had handled so many papers that had sort of the last paragraph, you know, the discussion <laughs> section, right? It's some crystal structure of a protein, right? Yeah. And at the end it says, this has huge therapeutic implications for Parkinson's disease. You know, yeah. I've written those papers myself, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And sort of unpacking that one sentence has been what I've been doing for the last six years. <laughs> and it's sort of, it's fascinating to so me. It's like the, the, and you can cite this paper too, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it was, it was a real opportunity for me, and I think it's continued to be an opportunity for me to both assist in and learn about this process of, of taking great science and turning it into actual application. And, and you know, a lot of you use the word deep science. How, what, what are the boxes you put around the types of science that you consider 
Yeah, so, so we played around with a lot of different things in, in constructing how breakout labs would work and eventually settled on our own kind of rubric of what we're looking for. And what we're looking for at the heart of our companies is a, a fundamental scientific advance, a, a, um, a result. Quite often they're spun out of academia where someone has, has a new discovery or a new technique uh, that has a broad impact. Um, so we're, we're talking about atoms, not bits, is what we like to say. Although leveraging bits is quite an important part of many of our companies. Um, an example, positron dynamics. Uh, when they applied to breakout labs, they had a um, simulation data that suggested they'd be able to create a moderator for positron beams, and we funded them to do the first prototyping. So that was their fundamental insight. Um, you know, we had that peer reviewed actually. So part of what I brought to breakout labs is the kind of journal peer review system that goes into evaluating uh, science at a phase where there's no product. So I think one of the big challenges of, of funding startups or, or investing in startups is really that diligence piece. Um, so, so we're looking for something that can, experts can say this is a fundamental scientific advance that has great potential. Um, and then the companies have a, um, a first commercialization hypothesis around what that technology can do. And if we can get behind that, then we'll fund them to help them develop that. Okay, and so, so Positron is a local company, obviously, so uh, that'll be of interest to all of us here. Can you tell us a little bit more? How did you come across them? Like, what, was, what were the other criterion that you used? How deep was this due diligence? Like, what, what was that whole experience like for us? So they were very early. Actually, they were in our first cohort, which we funded in 2012. Um, so we essentially opened our doors in 2011, and we said, okay, we, the foundation, are going to put operating dollars into um, philanthropic dollars into companies as effectors of change in society. So I can talk about the model of how we do that through the foundation. But we opened our doors, and we said, okay, um, we invite all companies that aspire to take a scientific advance and turning it into a company to apply, and you can apply for up to $350,000 in funding uh, to achieve specific R&D milestones. What percentage of companies apply for less? Um, in the beginning, quite a few did, okay. actually. And now everybody just okay, applies okay. for it. Like, like, and if they don't, we kind of look a bit askance, because we're like, really? Like, what don't you get? Um, so, so at the time, that, that we opened our doors, and we took proposals over the web. We literally, um, and that is still how we work. So companies literally apply, send in a pre-proposal through our website, and we take that very, very seriously. And we have a lot of trouble convincing entrepreneurs that we actually take that very, very seriously, because I think in the venture world. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 yeah. that's an inbox that goes to the outbox. No, but it actually comes directly to me, and, um, and it is an opportunity for our team to sit down and think about um, you know, is, could this fit with our portfolio? But back in the positron dynamics day, we had no portfolio. Um, so uh, we got a pre-proposal from uh, Ryan and um, what is Josh? Yes, Josh. Yeah, well, no, I think it was Josh that was spearheading it at the time. Yeah, so we've got Dante over here from Positron. Um, and they submitted a pre-proposal and say, said, we're a Positron physicist and we have this idea and it could have a huge impact and we want to send, you know, um, missions to, to inter the galactic, you know, we, we want to we send, send things into space that have never gone, you know, as far before, right? So we were looking for a, a solid scientific insight, a big vision that we can get excited about, and then some concrete steps that we can really support to make that transition into something that is commercially viable. So for them it was, we have these simulations, we want to do a, a prototype, um, uh, and we funded that. And so they applied, they submitted a full proposal. Um, we had it reviewed. I, that's where the sort of journal peer review experience comes in. I basically source on a case-by-case -case basis reviewers for the particular proposal that we reach, or that we receive, because we get them, you know, we, we had at the same time we had that, we also had Modern Meadow, which is a company that is biofabricating leather from cells. So not the same peer review in that they, case. Not the same reviewers, yeah. you would yeah, be very, turns yeah. Out. Yeah, so, um, so that, you know, that's what I do is find these experts from around the world, really, who will sign our non-disclosure agreement. So they're usually academic scientists um, who are usually quite curious to see, here's something, a field I've been working with, here's something that might potentially, you know, change the world, be a practical application. I, I'd love to know more about that. So we get quite a good hit rate on the reviewers that we asked to review these proposals. They were favorable. Um, and then we interviewed... Um, and how many of those do you usually do? Two, three, four, five, ten? Um, uh, we use two to three, depending okay. on the technology, depending, you know, we, I look at the proposal, I have a research <coughs> associate that I work with, and we sort of say, okay, here are the big questions that we don't feel able to assess, who can we get to do that? 
Um, quite often, they don't, but you'll be shocked to learn the peer reviews don't always agree on, on the, the, the scientific importance. And they have opinions? They do, they do. And so part of my job, and I'd say part of what 10 years of journal peer <laughs> review has brought to me is the ability to kind of filter those comments and figure out which ones I think are meaningful for, with respect to the risk that we're willing to take. And um, if that all passes muster, then we interview the team and we do more of a kind of um, team to team venture lens, kind of, you know, are these people we want to work with? Are these people that, that um, we could help? Um, and then we make a decision and we do that on a rolling basis. Got it. And, and um, so as you, you mentioned, kind of like, like the venture side, right? Do you, do you think of yourself in that same regard or do you, do you, what analogs do you try to pull across and what ones do you try to leave behind? Well, I th we're definitely earlier. I mean, part of doing this out of the philanthropy is this idea that we are helping to bridge this gap without starting this equity clock ticking, right? We're, we're buying time for companies to really develop things that take a long time. It's, it's not a question of putting two engineers in a room with a lot of pizza and, you know, and, and slamming the door until they come up with something, right? Sometimes you, you need to... Are you putting to down my whole career? Oh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, there's nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, pizza's very important in fueling our, our Silicon Valley ecosystem. But, um, you know, sometimes a mouse experiment takes six months, yeah, right? Yeah. And that's just what it takes. And so um, we, we view ourselves as, uh, I, I would say that I guess our biggest worry in funding companies at the Breakout Lab stage is we don't want to fund, we don't want to plant seedlings that then have nowhere else to go. So we are, and as, as our program has grown, as we've become in, more and more in touch with networks of follow-on funders and corporates and all of that, our, our view of what is early enough that it still requires us, but not too early that our funding can't help them bridge that gap has, um, has refined. Got it. Uh, so I mean, that sounds like that's a big deal, right? If you guys are taking what, what most of my VC friends would call you know, the binary existential pre-product risk. Uh, I mean, how do, you, how do you gauge that? We certainly will see things that don't work, and I think if we don't, we're not taking enough risk. Um, so when we, when we look at a funding decision, you know, there's substantial scientific technical risk on the table. This stuff just may not work, and, and that's okay. So that would differentiate us from the VCs, right? Um, we're also, we're looking at typically scientist entrepreneurs, typically not a, you know, sophisticated management team around the table, but folks that can learn, can learn and can also lead to a point where there's real money on the table. So we do look closely at the team, but not maybe with the same lens as, as Venture. Uh, are, they, are they folks that can attract others to, to work with them? Are they folks that can take our advice? Are they people that know what they don't know and can learn from that? Can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, because that, that's a highly studied thing around Venture, right, is what these kind of profile founders are. What, what, what do you, go, go into that a little more. Well, I don't know that we have a, a pattern match in a typical phenotypical sense. Like, we have founders that are right out, postdocs out of a lab that have you know, worked on multi-million dollar funded research programs and are now taking that technology out. We have folks that have retired and have this idea that have been sitting around in their heads while they've been working on their day jobs and now they want to take that forward. So. Um, it's more about uh, so technical sophistication, um, because at the point we're dealing with these technologies, you really, it's not something that you can pluck it out and, and start running with it. There's still a lot of, uh, uh, you have to know the technology to know the opportunity. So that, that technical know-how, um, that full-time commitment, so at a certain point early in the day, we did have uh, co-founders that were sort of still had some day jobs. We also had um, academic founders who were still PIs, and they were going to hire a tech to work on the on the science and you know build out the company. Uh, we found that they didn't really have enough skin in the game, so we now have the full-time committed founder. Um, I, I don't. I, I don't know that there's a. You know, we have we have women, we have men, we have people from all across the country too. Um, one thing I'd say is that we're we're noticing. We have said that we'll fund companies all across the country, but to the earlier point about building an ecosystem, I think the companies that we see increasingly as folks that are submitting applications that that are that are. 
positively reviewed are folks that do have a local ecosystem where somebody has taken interest, somebody has been a sounding board for how they're hoping to develop their companies. Because we're at the point where we're still funding commercialization hypotheses. And I think over the time period that they work with us at Breakout Labs, they refine that and they, by the time they're raising a Series A, they have a commercial goal and they have you know, a, a serious idea of how they're going to make money for their investors. At the time we fund them, that is less clear. Okay, cool. And I'll come to the audience here. Uh, so start thinking about your questions. If you'd like, I'll come to your audience, the audience after uh, this next question. So, so uh, are most of these founders PhDs? Are they all PhDs? Are they, what are the education levels when you talk about this type of science? Mostly. Um, there have been some notable exceptions. We have a company, Immusoft, that was also part of our first batch. Uh, and they, uh, that's a computer scientist. Um, I think he might have a master's, but he uh, founded a company that is taking um, B cells, uh, so immune cells, out of your body and reprogramming them to produce therapeutics and putting them back in your body to then have them continue to, to produce therapeutics. And he really felt that the time was right for biology to be programmable and, um, and is an autodidact, uh, incredibly sharp man, and has built this company to now to the point where it is starting clinical trials in an orphan um, disease, MPS1, that is an enzyme deficiency. Uh, so. There are certainly exceptions to the rule, but the uh, rare. That sounds like a worthy exception uh, to the rule. De in definitely. Case. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, I, let me go out here. Uh, go ahead. Why do you call it a lab rather than a center or something else? Oh, the name Breakout Labs? I so think the question, just, oh, just to be clear, sorry. the question is why, why is it a lab versus a center? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just repeat it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the name Breakout Labs, I don't even know how we arrived at it. I guess in the beginning we were looking so, so part of the reason we started Breakout Labs was both the um, need for capital at this point where this gap is being bridged, but also the opportunity that we were seeing around being able to do more with less. And so there was all this DIY bio stuff happening. A lot of our, our origins are actually more in this kind of biotech writ large space. And so we're seeing these incubator spaces opening and you could buy equipment on eBay and you could outsource to CROs all these experiments. So you could do a lot more with a lot less and yet that lot less was there. And so I think it was in the spirit of that DIY lab sort of thing that we came up with the name. We have trouble classifying ourselves because we're not, a, we're not an incubator. Um, we're not really an accelerator because we work with companies for a period of, of two years is our a real commitment to them. Um, and we work with companies all across the country. So I don't really know what to call us. It's just a name. Okay. Cool. There was another question back here. Yeah, uh, could you give me give us some insight into the split between companies that are purely software and companies that need some form of hardware? Um, yeah, so we don't really do pure software plays. Um, we have there's an there's a couple of exceptions to that. There's a company um, Skyphrase that we funded in 2012 or 2013, I think, and they were a natural language processing company. Um, they came out of a work, a professor at RPI had uh, been working for some years on sort of combining uh, a semantic models with statistical processing and come up with a sort of a theory of language processing that had some deep cognitive roots and, and that was the science that we had reviewed and a novel approach uh, to, to natural language processing that interested us. And so on the basis of that and the reviews from our experts that that was indeed novel, we funded them to build a basically a search application um, actually, they ended up, our, our comp somebody um, at Yahoo Labs read about them in our, in our press um, and snapped them up before they could ever, they aqua hired them basically. Uh, our challenge with doing, and, and then um, we have another company but it actually isn't announced yet, I just realized. Uh, but in general, we need something that is a substantive scientific advance even if it is software that is unique. So what we, because of our diligence process, what we're not good at, and frankly what there are others around to support and do better than us is this again this notion of we're trusting you because we think you're great coders or you have this track record and you can really do this where speed and know-how and talent is of the essence but at the core of it there's not something there that's unique in sort of an IP sense. Anything else here in the audience? One more back there. Less. Yeah, so how do you measure your success? Is it is social impact or economic success or both? And how is that going to change in the future if you don't have enough track record to measure it uh, so far? So the question is how do you measure your success? 
Uh, well, at the moment we look at how our companies are doing and whether they're making progress and that usually looks at you know, dollars that they're bringing in and, and, and continuing to live another day is about the most we can do because these are pretty long <laughs> plays, right? Um, uh, so not dying. Not dying, not dying, number one, number one, right? Um, but I'd say that we're not, we're not impact investors. We're not out there to solve a particular problem, and I think that makes us distinct from a lot of different foundations. We really are about empowering this visionary entrepreneur that has this technological ability and insight. And part of that foundation rests in uh, partly my personal view that Quite often folks fund things because the solution is so important, but the technology might not be there to meet it. And with my neuroscience background, the thing I think about a lot is sort of autism research, where a ton of money has gone into because it's such a, right, but, but maybe, the, maybe the brain science just isn't there yet. And so for us to say we want to solve a particular problem, I think misses the, the, the technology coming to rise to meet the, the problem. And so we've really said, you know, you're a technologist, you're an entrepreneur, you come to us and here's your technology and here's a vision of what you can solve. And if we can get excited and behind that, then we'll, we'll run with it. Um, so we have a company, as I mentioned earlier, Modern Meadow, um, which actually started out trying to biofabricate meat. So you've seen maybe these lab-grown hamburgers. There's a couple of different plays right there. And, and that was actually what we first funded them for, was to grow meat in the lab. And it, it sort of turned out that you know selling a $500 crappy hamburger is just not really a great business model. So they've kind of evolved. And now they're, um, they're selling no-kill leather. And they're starting out in these kind of designer leather markets where they really can sell things at a premium. And they've really found something you know, that their technology is moving towards as a first application. Doesn't mean they're not going to get to meet someday. And their big vision is really you know, changing the, the sort of post-animal husbandry landscape, whatever you want to. So it is a big vision. But um, if they, frankly, uh, create a great business selling no-kill leather, I think we'll consider that a success. So, so let, let's build off that a little bit. So there's like Impossible Foods and yep. a couple of other companies in that space. And, and I would guess, you know, if I remember the timeline, Impossible Foods, they only started like four years ago. Yep. So would you consider that also success that maybe you spurned in, in uh, investment by other people in the category that you thought was meaningful? Or does that still feel like you kind of missed? So Pat Brown is a friend of mine. He was the founder of PLOS, and he's now the, the okay. founder of Impossible Foods. And um, they got bigger money faster. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that we spurned them. Um, we certainly won't. So one of the things we won't do is fund two companies in the same space around the same time, uh, because we really feel like we're trying to build this cohort of sort of visionary scientists, entrepreneurs that can learn from each other as well as from us. And so, yeah, uh, we made our bet. We placed it. Um, most foundations fund companies uh, through mission-related investments or program-related investments, and it's their investment arm that does it. So we, on the other hand, it's our granting arm that does that. And because of that, um, we have some interesting, uh, we have a, a unique grant agreement. Yeah, actually, how do you do that? The so we right, like there was regulation passed last year specifically related to this, right, in the PRI world. Yeah, so we don't do PRIs. We do what's called um, expenditure responsibility grants, and they are grants that can be issued uh, with the expectation that they will be a social good to individuals or for profits, really to anyone, provided that they report they re meet certain reporting requirements back to us. And so that's the mechanism we use. Hmm. And so uh, we give grants um, just to complete the financial piece, and then. If the companies don't succeed or go on to become lifestyle businesses or whatever, no harm, no foul, if they end up uh, doing usually a, a Series A, um, our, our money, uh, is ex our grants are exchanged for equity with a 20% discount. So it's, it's kind of like a convertible grant, although the lawyers don't really like that as a term. Um, so that is, that's, the, that's what it is. Um, Erase that part of the footage. Yeah. <laughs> Good one, Proctor, are you here? I, I yeah, didn't right. say that right. Um, we have a number of relationships with corporate partners, and we're always welcoming those. And I think we serve as a really effective interface between the, you know, the giant company and the tiny company. And the tiny company has the meeting and thinks, oh my god, they're going to give us money tomorrow. And, <laughs> right? and, and the big company is like, oh yes, let's kick it up the ladder to our next committee that they'll discuss. And so yeah, setting, VP's not VP at this company, right? right? Exactly. So setting expectations. Um, we do a lot of work in matchmaking. And, and ultimately, we're really looking to help connect our um, companies with the follow-on investors and, and folks that they'll need to work with going forward. And in order to do that, we have to make sure that they 
they can represent us well. So that ends up being working with them to the point where their, their story makes enough sense to us that we can then pitch it to folks around the table with us. Very cool. And there are a couple more here. Uh, the gentleman in the blue here. So the question oh. is, will the political environment have impact on the strategy? Um, I would say that where we are in the life cycle of these companies is quite early to be making decisions about you know what FDA regulation is going to look like in five years, which is when our companies are probably playing. So I think regardless of the political climate, the need for innovation is not going away, and the amount of investment that's gone into research is there to be tapped into. Um, so I have not seen any, we have not shifted um, our strategy in response to sort of macroeconomic features. Um, where we do evolve, I would say, is as we work with our network and get feedback on the kinds of companies that we're funding. Um, again, going back to the biggest fear of they're not going to, if we fund them and there's no one to pick up after us, then we're just funding seedlings to no end. Um, so I guess I would say that I personally rely more on the next level up to be looking at the next level up to be looking at the next level up. So for us, if there's folks around the table that are interested in funding the companies that we're trying to support to take them to that next level, that's good enough for me, um, assuming that they've done their homework around what comes next. So, so I think a, a, a good example you brought up climate, and, and I'll toss this your way if, yeah. if it's cool to talk about, would be Opus. You wanna, would you like to talk about Opus? Because that's also an East Bay company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're both um, actually advisors to, to this company, Opus 12, which came out of an, another um, accelerator, incubator, called Cyclotron Road uh, at Lawrence Berkeley. And they are, um, they have an a, a electrochemical reduction of carbon dioxide, a catalyst technology that allows them to create chemicals um, using carbon dioxide oxide emissions as the, the source of the carbon, essentially. Um, and so they, um, I met them actually several years ago when they first came into uh, Lawrence Berkeley, uh, to, into Cyclotron Road, and their first market is actually producing on-demand carbon monoxide. And so they've sort of identified this place <coughs> where they can um, build a, you know, a relatively small, they call it a dishwasher, uh, size apparatus to put into local environments rather than having to, to deal with all the shipping of carbon monoxide. Um, and so they're a, they're a great example of a company that was building on a fundamental catalyst advance. I don't know if you had and, some and yeah, I mean, As it relates to your question about climate change, so I run a, I'm, run a climate change specific uh, accelerator, which is how I work with them. And we, we partner together uh, on that, kind of regardless of what the, the political environment is. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, they have this very practical strategy to get to point B. And I don't know how that's going to evolve. And it may evolve in different ways depending on you know, the state of the world in terms of its support for climate technologies. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Uh, the lady here. Um, I work at Sandia National Lab. So one of the national labs, obviously. Good. We have a whole host of different kinds of technology. So is breakout labs focusing on any specific area? Or is it basically agnostic as long as the technology has uh, real capabilities and you will look at them? Yeah, we're, we're looking for technologies we haven't seen before with exciting applications, essentially. So um, we, as I said before, we try not to bring competing companies or close companies together. So that's the pre-proposal phase of our application process. It's a kind of non-transparent yay or nay that's based around what do we have currently? Where do we look at our risk? And, and you know, we are building a portfolio that we do need to measure success for at some point to get back to that earlier point. So we do want to, to spread our um, uh, uh, opportunities around rather than focus, say, you know, exclusively on different diagnostics or, or something like that. Um, but uh, apart from that, no, we're, we're very, I guess the other piece is that we only fund up to $350,000 or $350,000. <laughs> and um, I think I should correct something or adapt something I said before. We know that that's not actually enough to get to a major, major inflection point, um, but it should be order of magnitude. So most of our companies go on to raise probably a million or two in a convertible note before they're really ready for a Series A. Um, and they're doing, and they're also getting government grants, SBIRs, that kind of thing. And our companies have, some 40, 50% success rate on the SBIR front, which we also help them a little bit with. Um, but uh, the technology should be something where, as I say, that money is meaningful. So if they need 
ten million dollars to build a giant prototype, or if the if the play is really a giant infrastructure play of getting in with utilities or whatever it might be, that's probably not where we it makes the most sense for us to be able to help. Got it. And there was another question towards the back. Sorry. There you go. I'm going to follow up on the climate question. Uh, are there companies in your, you know, who have benefited from your advice and funding, um, who have worked on the impact of climate change prediction forecasting capabilities, technologies? No. <laughs> uh, not that that wouldn't be interesting, but but no. So the question, just for the yeah, record, was uh, whether you have companies in the climate change prediction space. So just the video. Any other questions here? Oh. Yep. Well, it sounds like you guys, the difference between you guys and a VC is you guys really cultivate, you spend your, your time cultivating the company to get them up to a, a point where the VCs are interested and the, they're ready for a Series A. Do you guys, through your funding stream, do you guys ever consider, or do you take a piece of the pie at any point, or look at taking a piece of the pie, and, or is it strictly a, a $350,000 grant? So the question was about our granting mechanism, and it, it, it's not strictly a grant. It does, it's like a convertible grant. So basically, we don't value the companies when they come into the program. Once the, and, and not of our, all of our companies will be venture-backable. We, we are interested in companies that may have different trajectories, but the fraction of companies that go, do go on to this venture, venture scenario, once they raise a venture round, um, there will be a valuation on that company, and our, our money that we put in will effectively buy shares in, be exchanged for equity in the company. Um, that, uh, I would say another way that we differ from VCs is the area of risk and the, and the expectation of return. We do expect it, it will have some return to the foundation. Our back of the envelope calculations were at some point that we might get half the money we put out back into the foundation, and that will be used to support more companies. So it was intended as a sort of stability mechanism, um, but also a mechanism to keep in our own minds the fact that we're funding companies and not research projects, which is actually something that's hard at the phase that we're working at. So that was what, uh, our kind of effort to signal to the world that we're funding companies, signal to other investors that we're funding companies, but not put a burden on them given the risk profile that would be uh, prohibitive. Very cool. So I'm going to take one more question and then I'll transition back to uh, a couple line of questions and come back. So. Uh, if you do have a question, just hold on to it for a second. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Jesper. I'm with Sandstone Diagnostics. Um, so you've seen a lot of brilliant engineers come from the bench and trying to start this company. Uh, apart from the dollars you put in, what is the biggest need you see in this group of people that they need to get their company to the next stage? So, so the question was, what's the biggest need other than money that you generally see from these scientific uh, breakthroughs? I think feedback on their business plan and helping them to develop it. I would say, uh, by, de by design, we fund platform technologies with the potential for many applications. Selecting that first application is really, really hard because there is so much potential. At the same time, there are, um, you know, there, there are constraints. As the technology evolves, the, the companies will realize, oh, actually, um, it, it, we can't quite do that as cheaply or as efficiently as others might solve this problem. That there's, there's all these practical constraints that evolve as the maturity of the technology plays place. But then there's also that, that interaction um, with the, the potential world of folks that are going to work with them, partner with them, and so on. And so we really encourage our companies to kind of get out there and share more rather than less. We've certainly seen in, in some of our companies a, a degree of paranoia that has been hugely uh, uh, hindering to them. Because frankly, this stuff is so hard that the idea that someone's going to make off with it so hard and so early, that the idea that someone's going to make off with it and, and use it and, and steal their ideas is so low compared to the, the positives of getting out there and talking about your technology and hearing, oh, actually, um, this is an application that would make a lot of sense that you would not even have thought of. So uh, some of our companies have come to us and we don't have an easy solution to say, you know, we're trying to hire somebody to, to look at different markets, you know, blue sky markets, and figure out what our technology is good for. And that's just really hard. Very cool. So, uh one of the things, that, again, to kind of build off the positron dynamics. So what's one of the things that's important to all of us in the room is developing this community and, and developing. We talked about kind of an entrepreneurial uh, community has the three things. You've got capital, 
um, businesses and then resources. And I think, you know, we've got the labs here, which is kind of, you can think about as a resource, but how did you, did it matter for positive fund dynamics that they're near the two national labs? Did that, was that a positive or negative thing? Was it great that it was near? How did you think about that? Um, well, they weren't <laughs> at the outset. It was actually, um, yeah, it was a much more of a virtual company uh, than, than it is now. Um, we, we don't look, so we ask companies, you know, what is your available infrastructure? What is your means of, you know, wh what do you have that, that, that goes beyond the capital particularly? And a lot of them will say we're operating out of this incubator and so on. And that's, that's always a plus. Um, I think it shines through in the application more than anything else. Generally, um, although we haven't ruled out funding uh, single founders, for example, increasingly teams have stronger applications and where do you get those teams? It's through this kind of local ecosystem and maybe they're not full-time teams, but they're folks around that are getting excited about what's happening. So I'd say that, um, and, and then the sophistication because they've had some mentorship, someone has talked to them about what their markets could be and we don't expect a sophisticated, you know, this is the, the TAMs and the, all, the, you know, all this stuff about, uh, about the markets. Um, we don't expect the level of sophistication that an, a, a venture investor would, for example, but we do expect a certain level of savvy and that comes through from the coaching they've had from their local environments, from the opportunity to work with a mentor. We do look at, you know, oftentimes companies will bring in consultant advisor types that are working with them to define what their first market will be and that brings for a stronger uh, discussion around the table as we're interviewing the teams. So I guess there's not an overt kind of check the box, oh, you know, they're not in an area that has, is as rich, but it comes through. Got it. And, and you mentioned, you, you've mentioned this a couple of times, right? So you're investing in companies and not science projects. Um, for deep science, that line feels like more than a little fuzzy. How do you get your head around that? Is it it's hard. Okay. It's, it's really, I think it is a big challenge. Um, at the end, it, it, increasingly, it comes back to what I was saying earlier of who's going who's gonna to come after us and what, what evidence do you have that these research milestones are really going to be meaningful to someone outside the research community. So, um, you know, we're going to improve <coughs> tenfold our ability to detect X. Um, well, what evidence do you have that that tenfold improvement is going to matter to anybody? Um, we're going to, you know, this, this optimize. Optimize against what? Mm -hmm. So I think having a, a sense of what, and, and quite often, as I say, that the, the companies will change their first application, but the idea that they are working towards something and that is, that is informing or guiding their uh, R&D, I would say, is, is sort of a critical, and that R&D might still be really, really early. But it is, it is guided and, and the parameters that are put around it are informed by what the market could be. And you, you also, in, in the same breath, you mentioned the L word, which in VC is the, the lifestyle business. Um, it's a four letter word for those of you that, uh, that are familiar with this. Like, I mean, is that, do you also see that as kind of a four letter word or is that at least sustainable? Is sustainability an okay outcome from the outset or is that, Let's shoot for something big, and if we end up there, it's okay. Yeah, it's not an ideal outcome in terms of impact. Okay. It really isn't. Um, and where that has ended up has actually been where the, the aspiration has, has not succeeded. Got it. Uh, so it's, an, it, it, it's not a failure if in, in the broader sense, but it's not what you shoot for. I think that's right. Okay. I think we're definitely shooting for a bigger impact, and for us, that impact is simul it, it's tied with the financial impact as well. Okay, gotcha. And then, like, so, so this is hard, it's just like intellectually even just understanding everything you're saying. What, how does that translate into your day to day? Do you go to the office every day? Do you like fly around and meet scientists and run through labs? Like what, what is that? Um, so I do spend a lot of time at my desk looking at proposals that come in online, pre-proposals every day. There's a couple, right, and, and doing some research around that. Uh, I go to a lot of events like this. I think our biggest challenge is the place we play is relatively narrow. So we um, draw a hard line and say if a company's raised, say, a million dollars in investment, not grants and all that, um, then it's probably too rich for our blood. Uh, at the same time, we need to fund companies that have formed as companies. 
So you go to an academic research class, you go to the Materials Research Society meeting, <laughs> and you're overwhelmed by folks, you know, poster presentations and all the stuff that looks good and, and innovative and all of that. Um, and then you go to a, a life sciences bio forum or whatever, and it's all companies that are raising Series A, and they have you know a few million dollars in their you know professional management and all of that. So finding that. Um, that those companies that are at the phase that we're really excited to support means going out and talking to incubators and going to entrepreneurial centers and judging business plan competitions and uh, going to you know the RPE conference. I was there last week. So I'd say a week out of every month, I'm sort of traveling around um, trying to meet folks that are in this space. We also recently started, I guess two years ago now, started uh, an ambassador program where we have eight to 10 uh, junior scientists, typically uh, PhDs or postdocs, at research universities or institutes across the country, and they we give them a hoodie and some business cards, and um, <laughs> and they're you know they're excited for the opportunity to go so out. So you do borrow from my industry then? Oh That's yeah, oh god yeah, okay. you know the hoodie, big thing. I almost wore my breakout last hoodie, but I thought yeah, it's too hot. Um, yeah, so that we find that they are they're folks that are interested in entrepreneurship and want to get out and meet the folks in their community, but they don't really have a, a, a venue to, or a, a presence to do that, right? There's some random, right? And so if they go to a competition and they can go up and say, oh, you know, we, I, I volunteer for breakout labs and this is something you might be interested in. Um, we have that as a means for keeping tabs of what's going on on the ground and they've been very effective at uh, introducing me to potential applicants. A lot of, even though we do take online applications, um, a lot of folks don't believe us and so want to have the conversation with me. So I will get on the phone with folks that um, are introduced either through our partners at different entrepreneurial centers or through our ambassadors and talk through our process and our grant agreement and all of that because it's pretty complex, as you just said. Yeah. Do, you, do you go hunting? Do you go like through Arvix and like, like look for citations and things like go hunting for science that you think would be interesting? No, because we're really about the scientist entrepreneur. And if there, there could be absolutely fantastic technology, but if there's not somebody whose heart and soul is in, in building the business, then we're not in the business of creating companies. There are, there are, right? There are um, VCs that will go trolling and put a management team, particularly in the healthcare space. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, for us, has been one of the reasons we've actually pulled back a little from therapeutics because it seems as though, um, and I think it's actually quite a good uh, a phenomenon where the, the therapeutic um, development process is something that is pretty streamlined, right? You have a new target, you, you find a lead compound, you do, right? And, and there, there is a, a sense that a professional streamlined team can take those assets and put them through this pipeline and come out the other side. Mm -hmm. And so the entrepreneur that's trying to build a business around a single asset, it, it may not make a lot of sense. So we don't support them. Got it. But you do have, so, so within the teal, <laughs> kind of family office, they do have a venture arm. Would you, do you coordinate and collaborate with them at all? No, and partly, you know, we're the philanthropy, so we can't be specially, um, you know, uh, have special relationships with oh, yeah, the yeah, non-philanthropic yeah, yeah. arm. But, but more than that, I would say that the venture funds that are in the teal world are actually quite large funds. And so once you get to the point of having a billion dollar fund, uh, the odds that they're going to be funding a company that's right out of breakout labs are, are minuscule to, it doesn't make sense for them, right? They have to do as much diligence to put in $500,000 or a million dollars as $100 million. So, um, and we are not necessarily building unicorns. Uh, I think there are some companies. I used the U word. That's a good one. I'm sorry. I, you know, I've learned so much since I moved to the Bay Area. I did not know. I did not know the word lifestyle business. I didn't know. I thought unicorns when they first said it. I was like, what? what virgins? What? I really didn't know. Um, but we we see a lot of potential attractive. Uh, important innovations that may be acquired at an earlier phase uh, with less money put in. And that's something that these larger venture funds just can't help with. Mm -hmm. So who do you partner with? So you talked about this next stage, the, the people who will carry the seedling to the, to even to the next stage. Who do you work with? Um, there's a lot of family <coughs> offices. There are angel investors. Uh, we, we did actually, we've launched something called Breakout Ventures uh, in the last year or so. 
And that has grew more out of, in fact, a demand for the folks that were around us that were interested in what we were doing and wanted to invest but couldn't do the one-off deals. And so we have created this vehicle for these interested so LPs. So it's actually LP. So it's not yeah. it's not Peter's money in. Oh no, no, yeah, Peter's a you know an anchor investor, but um, but but the, we, but the, the bulk impetus of was the, to bring in other capital absolutely. for portfolio distribution. Yes, absolutely, and and also to build that network. So you know all of our Breakout Ventures LPs now come to our big unboxing event and they've made individual relationships now with some of our companies that they get excited about. So the big challenge, of course, is that you know one family office and you know one family office, right? Yeah. There's no yeah, rubric yeah. of trying to identify. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Dolby Family Ventures was uh, invested in, a, in several of our companies, um, one, of which, one of which is working on a sepsis diagnostic because they had a family experience with sepsis, right? And how do you you know that was a serendipitous event so again uh, talking about these making opportunities for these kinds of collisions um, we try and you know uh, cultivate those folks that could be interested in different ones of our companies and then introduce them as the time is right okay. um, so there are a few venture funds that follow pretty closely what we do um, and and pay attention but there aren't that many in this world as you know okay gotcha um, I'll come back out is there any any other questions from the audience here Oh, come on. This will be the first time ever. All right, let's take one more. Thanks. Uh, How many do you fund a year? We fund eight to 10 companies a year. Uh, we, um, we actually have not met that goal. Uh, we funded 35 companies, 30, 33 or 34 companies in the last uh, four and a half years or so. But well, and, and it sounds like you also have a self-selecting process. So if they don't have a at least something of a there there right. you guys don't generally accept them in the, in the first place I think that's right I think a lot of our companies have not been successful before they've been given the breakout labs grant and have gone on to be successful some of that I think is probably a lack of academic uh, relationships and collaborations I think that makes it much harder for companies to um, get those kinds of grants but I think we can help with that so if, if you will I, I want to go back to this the you mentioned a couple times this transition from deep science, we talked about in the context of positron dynamics from a simulator to now something that's kind of the next step. Um, from a layperson's perspective, it seems like the, these innovations maybe coming from the labs or coming from anywhere, the transition to commercialization seems very linear, um, but it, it's, it's obviously very not. Like, w Are there any kind of archetypical steps or parts of that process that you could share with us or maybe a story of, a, of one of the particular companies that had kind of an interesting journey through that? Gosh, all of them have interesting journeys through that. Um, I, mean, I think about a, a company, 3Scan, that came to us there in San Francisco, and they, um, they're now, they just raised a Series B, they're building a, a robust uh, um, business around, uh, so their, their innovation was a uh, knife, knife edge scanning microscope, which is uh, basically a machine that allows you to automatically slice tissue, takes a picture of it, and you slice the next tissue and takes a picture of it, and then it digitally reconstructs to the micron level the tissue. Um, and so you can imagine, you do that automatically, it's digital pathology, you, you, you skip the step of having to do all that manual labor and you come up with a whole new rich data set that pharma is very interested in to use for um, preclinical work, right? You, you have a drug, is it affecting vasculature? Well, how is it changing, right? That's so on and so forth. Um, they came to us and they had uh, licensed out that core technology. The, the CEO had previously worked in the lab um, with, the found, with the founding scientist and done a lot of the development work and then that scientist actually died. And so that technology was gonna die as well because academic science, right? It's sort of you, your baby and you, you're no longer there to carry it forward. Uh, so he licensed that technology and developed it and we funded them to do some fluorescence uh, work around um, building a fluorescence uh, detection or a fluorescence capability for that microscope and that system. Um, and at the outset, it really wasn't clear what that business was. They were still talking about digitally reconstructing brains and that was a, a very interesting thing from a sort of intellectual pursuit. And they were talking about 
um, the ability to, to look at neural architecture, but who was going to pay to look at neural architecture. Um, we connected them fairly early on with some corporate folks, uh, folks at GE they presented to. Uh, GE came in and listened to several of our companies pitch. Um, and then uh, I think they, they talked to folks at Agilent based on our sort of introductions. And eventually they honed in on this digital pathology market. They met uh, people at the Mayo Clinic who told them very interestingly that uh, pathologists are becoming scarcer and scarcer. So all these people that are retiring um, and there's not new people that are interested in becoming pathologists. So they got interested in the technology and helped to work with them and support them. And so it was kind of this, uh, as I said before, this process of meeting the different players that might use their technology that really helped them to figure out that actually what they were was this digital pathology business. Um, and, and started out as a service business, and they ultimately may go into diagnostics, I don't know, but, um, but really figuring out that this was something that was a need, and they had no idea that you know, digital path pathologists were gonna be a thing of the past, and that Mayo Clinic was very worried about it. So um, I think we see that over and over again, where these companies are um, <laughs> developing their technology while talking about uh, what it can and can't do with folks that could eventually buy it or use it. And how much time did you spend, like, personally and as a team spend with 3Scan for this as example? Quite a lot. It was more my colleague, Lindy Fishburne, who's the uh, person that's on, on the, as their board observer. So we all split up the, the, the board observer seats, although we all kind of pay attention to everything. But there's one sort of team, core person on the team that takes an interest in a particular company. And, um, oh, she would go, she actually, uh, she brought her husband to help with the uh, storytelling, who is a journalist and uh, also a, a, a writer and a professional storyteller to kind of help um, at a certain point unpack that story. So, uh, and we introduced them to their Series A investors. Uh, so, you know, we don't, we, we say over and over again, we are not, y you're building your business. And the companies that, know how to ask us most effectively for, for help are really the ones that we can help the most. So I give all credit to Todd, who's the CEO, and his team for really using us in a strategic way. And I see that even now in the communications that he sends to his board. And that level of keeping folks informed and giving them the tools to be able to reach out into their own networks has been really important to their success. Cool. Well, and, and, and I'm going to ask a question that you told me not to ask. Um, <laughs> uh, so the, uh, one of the things, again, from kind of a layperson's perspective is we see all this stuff happening in all these areas of science. If you were to kind of wave your wand and, and, and kind of point it in one direction where you think there's like just amazing amounts of promise right now, what, what do you think about? Like what goes on in your head as you think about that space? I, uh, I, I told you not to ask me that question because <laughs> um, I'm, I'm constantly excited about the stuff that I don't know about, to be honest. You know, there, there's so much going on in cancer immunology, for example. It's a very, immunology is a very exciting time. We probably won't fund any companies in that area because there seems to be a lot of money going into it and a lot of different angles that are covered um, there. We've seen an increasing interesting set of materials companies. Um, it seems as though uh, there's, there's a level of, I, I don't know what it is, I don't know if the materials genome project of old, I, I, I don't know, but we're seeing more and more companies that have these really interesting new material capabilities being applied, both on the bio side, but also on, on Are they nano-oriented? Are they like yeah, process-oriented? So yeah, so we have a company, <coughs> NanoGrip Tech, which is um, Velcro 4.0, whatever. It's, it's based on this old idea that the geckos do these amazing things, right? And it's because of the nanostructure. And there's been a lot of academic research. And I, frankly, as a naive scientist who reads nature, thought that this problem was solved. And then it turns out that actually, you know, making that in a roll-to-roll -roll process in a scalable way that's cheap enough to make a difference is non-trivial. And that, that was the solution that that company came up with for us to fund was a roll-to-roll -roll process that would make these this material cheaply enough that it could actually be sold. And um, they have customers ranging from you know athletic apparel wear. They have this company that actually reached out to them um, uh, to make jodhpurs for horse riding. So the, the, the riders stick to the horses better. And they, they ran. <laughs> 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 
So that, that company read about Nanogrip Tech, and yeah. Um, so we have another company, C2 Cent. What were you going to say? No, I'm not going to say it. You're right. No, you're not? Okay. You're right. um, we have another company, C2 Cents, that has um, carbon nanotube based technology uh, that allows them to sense gases um, and, and have that convert directly into a digital signal at very cheaply. And so they're, they're in the um, uh, ag space at the moment, sensing uh, fruit ripening and so on. Um, so just, it, it seems like many companies are coming to us, and maybe that's that platform thing that are, that are these new materials that have really interesting properties. Cool. Um, I will come back out to the audience here. We have one right here. How long did you stay involved in your companies? It seems like you invested in 2011 and you're still involved in some of those and But you said it's only two years, so yeah. what's going on? What's going on? So we started investing in 2012. Our first companies are from 2012. And our formal agreement is, we recently formalized the agreement basically as we mature ourselves in our startup phase to say that at a minimum, we will pay for you to come to our events for two years, you know, the ones that we hold, and we will engage in this process and so on. Um, at that point, sort of the, the winners tend to stay, we tend to stay involved in them, the ones that are really progressing. And, and actually, some lie silent for a while and then come back. So um, we have a formal board observer commitment uh, through the Series A, I believe that is, um, although some of the grant agreements are a little bit different from others, I think, over time. But I think where we are really the most help is, is up to the Series A raise. And at that point, they get others around the table that, that can provide more assistance. But we also, our network grows, and we also know folks that can fund later on. We tend to bring back some of our successful companies into our events so that they can teach our newer companies. So at our last unboxing event, we had a day of workshops. And one of them was two of our companies talking about their experiences raising Series A's and how to you know, force investors to actually sign something rather than being <laughs> endlessly interested in things, right? So that, that creating demand thing was something that they really focused on. Um, so I think we are, we are a, a community that continues to always be networked to each other. They're, they continue to be on our portal and provide recommendations for um, you know, lab space or, or HR support or whatever it might be that they have that might be of interest. Um, but in terms of our formal commitment to help and support, that is a, a two-year two kind of time frame. So I, I, the, my favorite thing in listening to you is like this um, kind of put all the names of the companies in a bag and pull one out. So let's just let's pull one more out and let's okay. just hear a story about any any random in, like one of your favorite fun stories about a company. Favorite fun stories about a company. You know, it's like asking which one of your children is favorite. I can um, tell you. Which one? <laughs> uh, it's my best friend's kids. They're amazing. Oh my God. I leave and they stay there. Wow. Okay. Well, then maybe I should tell you about a company outside of our company. <laughs> um, yeah, no, all, all our babies are, are precious. Um, well, we certainly, all of our companies are patenting, patenting at least a certain uh, level of their um, invention or discovery. It might be a use patent, which is you know, kind of one of the weaker ones, but it, it can, there, there are levels of patentability that go beyond the core discovery into the actual implementation, and I'm not an IP expert by any means. Um, most of our companies have filed provisional patents by the time they apply to breakout labs because then they're comfortable enough disclosing the information that we require to be able to, to vet the science appropriately. Um, not everything, they don't patent everything. They do rely on a level of trade secret or just implementation expertise. So I'm thinking particularly around some of the bioinformatics um, algorithms or computational discovery and things like that where um, some of that information actually might be in the public domain but then the implementation is so non-trivial and coding it into something that you can use on the cloud uh, rapidly enough to make a difference is actually um, going to be a barrier to entry. So I think there are multiple barriers to entries that our companies are working on, but we do view uh, core IP as fundamental to the companies that we support. Okay. Uh, any last? Oh, okay, one more. Uh, you don't take, uh, take any stake in the company, it's just uh, like a grant or <laughs> convertible grant? It's a, it's a convertible grant. So if the companies are successful, our, our grants are exchanged for equity with a discount. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to close with a, a question kind of thinking about the future. Even um, uh, 
a little bit closer to all of our hearts, which is, you know, a lot of us have kids and, and as you think about, again, you have this really neat view of getting to get into the minds of a lot of people who think they've discovered something great. As we look at guiding our kids either in high school or out of high school, what do you think, you know, the future holds? What would you, what would you tell us to kind of uh, lightly pat them on the bottom and send them in what direction? I think STEM. Right. Just I, broadly. I, I think broadly speaking, I think um, as, as I, I'm biased towards the more fundamentals. I always think that you can learn the peripherals later, but learning the fundamentals are, you know, the, the gonna gonna take you further. I mean, I I don't have kids. Um, I wonder about um, a world in which uh, AI is doing so much for us, but <laughs> you know, but I think there is always, there's going to be in, in my lifetime, I hope, uh, uh, the need for human invention and entrepreneurship. So I think in addition to learning the science, also thinking about um, not uh, focusing on, on any single career path at this point, but really being open to opportunity in a world that is changing really rapidly. So I always like to say, you know, be, be in a position where you're continuing to learn and continuing to be effective, um, and, and then new opportunities will come your way. Cool. Well, I, I, you did say the buzzwords, so I have to ask you that too since you're up here. So you're, you're a renowned scientist and you said AI. What is your opinion about, is AI evil, is AI good? What, <laughs> what, what's going to happen? Tell, let's, let's do the wax philosophical as our, oh as our wrap up. Oh God, do to do AI? Um, I, I think AI is, is really, you know, going to be very useful for a lot of practical things in our world. Do I think we're in danger of the singularity? Not anytime soon. Um, you know, I was I was at MIT in the '90s when we were talking about backpropagation algorithms and all of that, and now now we have the computational power, and we're calling it deep learning, but it fundamentally hasn't changed. Uh, I think there's a lot about the human brain that we don't understand, and back, pro back propagation is not actually uh, a solution or even reinforcement learning, or all the, all the algorithms we know about are not the sum total of what the human brain can do. So I'm relatively optimistic that we have some um, hidden depths. We'll have a little edge. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried. Okay, very cool. <laughs> are well, you worried? Uh, yes, but that's... <laughs> Um, that's a much, much longer conversation. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm worried for different reasons, like the social, the social implications of driving, right? I mean, I think that has, just all by itself, we, people say we recover from these economies. And I grew up in Oregon, and in Oregon, we right. had logging in the 80s. Right. And yeah, we recovered. We recovered 60% of the way back over 20 years, and it was a ding to 30% of our economy. We're talking about, like, yeah. I think, crushing the, entire regions. The job situation is different. I also think I just read Lisa Sunan wrote an article recently, and others have talked about this, about the fact that basically it's all a bunch of men coding, uh, and, and, and all, the, all the data that's going into all this AI is very sort of male-centric, and uh, that, you know, that leads algorithms to learn things that may not be um, in the interest of all of us. I, yeah, I, I think I, on that positive note, um, I want to say thank you, Henry. Um, for those in the audience, we do try to do talks every uh, every few weeks. We have another one on April 11th that I'll be doing, talking with another company that's raised uh, its uh, Series A very recently, which is actually AI, these guys right here. But again, if we can put our hands together one more time for Brandon, uh, Yolanda, and, and Henry. All right, that was even better than I expected it to be, and I had a pretty high bar set for that. So uh, thank you both to, to Sally and to Hemi, that was fantastic. I also want to thank again our sponsors, um, City of Pleasanton, Pam over here, so thank you very much. Um, Greg Hitchin and Innovate Pleasanton for hosting us. I saw John Lee from Silicon Valley Bank in the back over there. So. Uh, Since Goodwin Proctor, I don't think is actually here, I'll give all my love to Silicon Valley Bank. If you're doing a startup or thinking about doing a startup and you're not thinking about Silicon Valley Bank, you should be, so go talk to John. Um, I also want to give a shout out to our next, next tech speaker um, series speaker, Tim Harkness, who, if you could put his hand up right there. From, uh, 
So Tim is the CEO of Unchained Labs, which is a very fast growing, very interesting company here in Pleasanton. Um, so don't bug him tonight, because if you do, you won't come to our next event, and I need you to come. So leave him alone, uh, except to say hello, and please do come to our next event, which is gonna be May 9th, a Tuesday, and we'll start pushing out the, um, the uh, event information about that. So thank you all for coming. Um, please stay, mingle for a little while, not too long. I got kids, I gotta get home. But uh, thank you all for coming very much.